Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today's Gospel reading comes from the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, and in this, in this particular Gospel reading, we know that the Gospel of Mark moves much, much faster than, well, than the other Gospels. So already in chapter 2, he's not just on his first miracle, he's quite a way through. He's almost, and if we continued reading, we would, we would have found it, he's almost at the point where he's calling tax collectors to be apostles. Just in the next verses, we would be hearing that. But here, in today's reading, we have him teaching in a house. And it was jam-packed. They couldn't get in someone who was clearly incapacitated, who could probably really use the help of the Messiah. But there was just no room. There was no room to, to get in. It was shoulder to shoulder. And so what they did, because the houses were like rectangular prisons in those days, think cubes and you're not too far off. And so what you do when you wanted to get away in this one room apartment, you could climb the stairs next to the house and then go onto the roof. And it was a little bit of respite. There's only one downside to it. We didn't have the, uh, the, the, the various tradespeople that we do nowadays. And so the way to get through the roof was actually relatively straightforward. You took parts of it away and behold, there was no roof. And you'd have to do quite a bit to get a whole stretcher through. But nonetheless, this is quite doable. And that's exactly what was happening. You can imagine what the owner of the house was thinking. I let you in to teach and now my house is gone. And Jesus sees them. He sees their faith. Very interesting that that's more than one. It's not the guy who's lying on the stretcher. It's plausible that he had faith that Jesus would heal him. After all, there's nothing in, in the reading to suggest that he's objecting to being taken there. But it's not required. And clearly, there was faith in the others who were carrying him. They were the one who were bearing this burden on their shoulders. He saw their faith, plural, and said, your sins are forgiven. And then he gives a sign. Because the instinctive response is to say, oh, well, that's just words. In this time, it was more than that. To say your sins are forgiven you presumes that you are God. Do you have the audacity to forgive someone their sins? Not even by the power of but simply, your sins are forgiven you, then what you're saying is, I have the authority to get these sins out on the Day of Judgment. You're saying that I am the eternal judge. Priests don't dare to do this. We say, by the power that is given to us, we say, God forgives through me, but not I absolve you, not your sins are gone because of me. Whereas Jesus did, he did this on his authority. And the response was, well, you can't do that. Who, who do you think you are? Uh, and also, if you're claiming to be God, we can get you on blasphemy and you can be dead within the hour. And so he gives a physical sign. And it's this part here that I'm going to concentrate on today. This part here, he says, that you may believe that I can do the invisible, I'll show you the visible. He says to the man, arise, take up your bed and walk. Naturally, 
if someone is able to stand up and carry a stretcher, that's a little bit of weight right there. So they haven't just been able to walk. They haven't just been able to stand and hobble about. They're able to bear weight immediately and able to take this somewhere. Arise, take up your bed and walk. And this, of course, he does. Something really, really significant about this. This isn't the only time that he gives a that he gives something to do as a result of healing. We'll hear a few weeks after Easter where, where he says, Arise, take yourself to the pool of Siloam and wash your face, and then the blind man is healed. We'll hear other examples at other times in Scripture as well, where the miracle happens and an action is required. Your sins are forgiven you, so go and sin no more. Perhaps being one of the more common examples. This leads us to how this impacts on us. How is it that this impacts on us is because Christ has worked in our lives. Because we too, we too consider ourselves to be followers of him. The sheer fact of being Christian means to be a follower of Christ. It means literally to be a Jesus Christ person. And being an Orthodox Christian means that we above all ought to be following Christ. So if, we're, if we are going to have this audacity to say that we are followers of the Messiah, followers of someone who is able to forgive sins, who is able to make impact at the day of judgment, then this too requires our action. It's not enough to say, that sounds good. And we know that because of the examples in Scripture, because of the examples that we see in the Gospel. What is required is not just to say, oh, this seems wonderful, oh, this seems nice, because that's what we saw at the end of today's reading. And the crowd said, well, we never saw anything like this, but what did it change? Instead, we're looking for a change of life. What does this mean for us? It means that wherever we find ourselves, in whatever context we find ourselves, we find ourselves needing to be following Christ in that context. That's rather broad and general, I know, so let's work on some examples. Perhaps we'll be at, uh, at our course of studies, and someone bumps into us as they're getting to their seat. What should we do? Well, probably be okay with it. That, that seems a relatively small thing. What should we not do? Make a big thing of it. If this looks like it was an accident, well, it probably was. If it means if we find ourselves in a place of work and someone, co-worker, customer, superior, inferior, doesn't matter, and someone uh, finds themselves yelling at us, how then do we respond? By yelling back? Well, probably not. We're going to need to take a beat. We're going to need to resolve this in the best way that is available. Not in the fastest, not in the most immediate. They're usually not good ways. But in the best way, in the most Christ-following way. That may mean saying, we need to discuss this later. About we have a drink and then we can talk more. Maybe there's something real that needs to be sorted out. And maybe we feel quite strongly about this. That anger shouldn't be our response. And anger should certainly not be our reaction 
Just because someone else is angry doesn't mean that we have to be angry. We may find ourselves in broader society among, um, among people who, for whatever reason, don't like, don't want to like, don't respect, whatever the case may be, Christianity or Christians, etc. Well, sometimes, sometimes it's happening at a distance. We need to start by not reacting just based on instinct, not reacting based on fear, not reacting based on uh, their, their actions, and so I'm responding likewise. Because we can do better than that. We can take a beat, think, and then respond in the best way available. That pause is vital. We see ourselves at a restaurant. We know that, it's current, that, that we're currently in Great Lent, a time of fasting, and so we're following the fasting rule that we've been given. And if we find ourselves in a restaurant and we're, uh, and we're not able and we, we see a whole menu in front of us, maybe don't look at the expensive bottom part of the menu. Look for the simple foods. Look for the foods that, that follow both letter and spirit where it's available, even when it's inconvenient. It may mean that when we visit someone, perhaps we're visiting family who and, and we're in the circumstance where some of our family isn't, uh, isn't Orthodox Christians or, um, or aren't following the fasting rules or whatever the case, and they have, they have, out of the goodness of their heart, prepared something for us. It's going to mean accepting their hospitality. It's going to mean thanking them for considering you. Thanking them for their expression of love for you. When we say that we follow Christ, it's going to make an impact on our life. It's going to make that impact, not, not just automatically, although sometimes the impact that he makes is seismic. It's like an earthquake throwing our life apart and, and it's wonderful, but what do we do now? And other times, following him causes us to make changes. <laughs> How do we follow him in whichever context we find ourselves? This is the constant struggle, the constant uh, challenge for us as followers of Christ to stay within the, so to speak, boundary ropes, both for, both for temptations on the right and, for, and on the left. Which way shall we go? in order to follow him, to follow his example, to follow in the example of the saints who have gone on before us. Those people who have been set before us as luminaries. St. Gregory Palamas should come first to mind today, being as it's his Sunday, who was called to be bishop of a pretty major city, Thessalonica, who was called to to defend the church's teaching on a very important matter. That won't be the call for every one of us. It may be the call for some. There will be others. Perhaps we'll be following those monastics who requested St. Gregory to defend church teachings, who are spending their time in prayer, spending their time in meditation, spending their time contemplating the divine and trying to be as close to him as possible. Perhaps we'll spend, we'll be more like other saints, the righteous, who lived as best they could in the world, following the God that they knew and loved, or any of the others besides. And so just like those four stretcher bearers, let us likewise be seeking to follow Christ wherever we find ourselves to choose the action 
that follows him. That we may hear the words. That we may see Christ see in our faith. And hear that our sins, whatever wrongdoings we have, whatever flaws we have, have likewise been taken away from us, been forgiven us. Amen.